thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, my name is Hajjadinathan. I run technical evangelism for Microsoft, and uh, it's a privilege to show you uh, Windows 8 today. Uh, obviously, hard at work on the product for the last you know many years, and what you're seeing here is uh, is the consumer preview build, uh, you know, also known as the beta build. So, without much further ado, let me let me dive in. Windows 8 is the biggest release of Windows uh, since Windows 95. And we like to think about Windows 8 as Windows reimagined. So you will not only notice uh, a new start screen, you will notice a new runtime for applications. You will also notice uh, it runs on a wide range of hardware. So it runs on x86, it runs on x64. It also runs on ARM processors. So whether it's a, a Qualcomm Snapdragon, whether it's uh, an NVIDIA, uh, or whether it's a Texas Instrument chip, chipset. So it's going to run on x86, x64, and ARM. So which means it was, it's going to run on your PC, it's going to run on your uh, tab notebook, and it's also going to run on a new range of tablet hardware that is going to come to, come to market when the product is ready. And when we, when we started thinking about Windows 8, uh, we obviously wanted to make sure the, the release is big, the release is massive, and at the same time, it takes care of all the enhancements in computing technology that's been happening uh, since the release of Windows 7. And we'll try and show you some of those things. Uh, but before I dive in, you know, how many people here know Windows or use Windows? How many people here don't use Windows? You get the answer. Not a hand here, which is good. So, so I'm going to try and focus the rest of this conversation uh, in showing you Windows 7 and uh, Windows 8 and tell you how everything that was uh, that Windows 7 stood for, we take that and make it even better uh, with, uh, with Windows 8. So the first and biggest thing that we've done is we've changed the start screen. So the start button is gone uh, across the desktop, across the, the new interface. Uh, and when you start Windows, you essentially run into the start screen, which I'll show you in a moment. It's hardware accelerated, it's fast, fluid, and it also takes care of uh, new touch hardware. But at the same time, uh, Windows has been about keyboard and mouse, and we wanted to make sure, and Windows 8 does a fantastic job at this, making sure that touch is a first class citizen, but so are keyboard and mouse. So anything that you do with the keyboard, you can do with the touch, and you can also do it with the mouse. So that's kind of bringing together all of the user input form factor. And, and if you go back to the days of you know, Windows 3.1, uh, everything that was possible with the keyboard was also possible through the mouse. We continued with that paradigm. Today with Windows 8, we've added a new input form factor, touch. So when you look at Windows, you, you should you know, uh, experience it across all the three form factors, all the three input types. The other thing uh, that Windows has been you know, famous for, the Windows team has done a brilliant job for, is a great experience across hardware. So whether it's a PC at your home that your parents use, uh, or it's the shiny new tablet that you've got, or these big 23-inch you know, monitors uh, that do unbelievable DPIs, all of them are going to run Windows. So the, from, from a user interface perspective, obviously a ton of innovation, but the experience con is consistent across these devices. So whether it's tablets, laptops, all-in-ones, what have you, touch, mouse, keyboard, from the highest power water-cooled gaming systems to the lowest power ARM devices that are coming up in the market, all of them are going to run Windows, which is again hallmark, right? Uh, and all of these are going to support your USB peripherals, your printers, you know, your, your favorite apps. All of them are going to run. But, you know, instead of talking more about the product, let me show you the product. So, let's jump out of PowerPoint and let's hit the start screen. This is the new start screen. And when you press the Windows key, that's where you end up. So, I hit Windows, I end up in the start screen. And obviously, I get a great keyboard and mouse experience. You can see that. I can pan right, you know, I can pan left. or I can touch and move it across. So this is a special setup that we've got here. But you know, you can pan right, you can pan left. Uh, and the way to think about the OS in general is the OS is at the edges. So front and center is your app. So if you launch into your favorite app, your app is going to run corner to corner. So let me go ahead and launch Internet Explorer 10. So you see the application is edge to edge. There is no maximize button. There is no minimize button. Uh, there is no Chrome. Uh, for the window, kind of sound, right, no Chrome. Uh, but it's basically edge to edge. And the application gets to decide what happens in, in the full screen. 
Uh, the OS is absolutely there. So if you want to invoke an OS function uh, on the keyboard, you can do a Windows and C, and you get the charms on the right side. Or if you want to use the mouse, just over to the corner, and this is your new Alt tab. So you see a list of running apps on the left side. If you want to invoke the charms on the right side with the mouse, over over to the right, and to the corner, you basically get uh, charms, which allow you to search, allows you to share, allows you to get back to the start screen, and so on and so forth. The best way to think about this is the OS in the corner on the edge. Your app is everywhere else. Uh, and that's true. It's the corner four pixels on the screen, uh, which are actually used by Windows. And again, I'm showing you the, the keyboard and mouse experience. The same experience works just as well, uh, even on touch. So I can touch, and I can bring over the start screen. I can go back in and launch into IE 10, or uh, I could just keep pulling it from the side and you will keep seeing the various apps that are running. This is alt tab if you will. Of course, alt tab also works. So you know, you can continue to launch into metro style apps or work on the desktop. So, so everything that you knew about Windows 7 works just as well here. And again, you know, uh, compare this with uh, some of the other hardware that you have. Uh, whether it's a tap-on factor or whether even it's your, it's your current desktop. These are based on Metro design. So, so the whole user interface is much more modern, much more fluid. And if you pay close attention, uh, these styles are live. These are not icons. And you know, we've spoken a lot about icon-based uh, you know, user interfaces. They're pretty dated. Right? No, guesses for, no, you know, no prices for guessing uh, that the icon-based approach to computing is, is about 1980s when Xerox came up with it. So, Icon-based approaches, 30 years old. Uh, what we've tried to do with Metro is make it a lot more modern. So you don't have to launch an app to know that you have an email. You don't have to launch an app to find out what's your next appointment. All of that is available right off the application, you know, front screen. And you can see, you know, the photos experience, for example, right? Uh, that moves over as you, as you, uh, or, or that pans over as you, you know, stick with it. Uh, the other thing of course is uh, because this is a touch UI, it also makes it a lot more easier to navigate through all your applications. So these are all your metro style applications on this side, and then you have all the desktop mode applications on this side. So, so you want to run command prompt? Absolutely, that's right there. So you can do uh, develop a command prompt, you back into go to command prompt, and then hit the Windows key, back over to the metro style user interface. Uh, and again, because this is touch, you can do fancy things like uh, I want to move this Windows Explorer icon to, to somewhere else. I can just select it and I can just pan over with my other hand and drop it at the other corner. So, so simple user experience uh, that's made possible because of the touch UI. So fast, fluid, everything you know about Windows 7, just better. The other thing of course is what happens to your apps. So there are a bunch of apps here. Uh, let me launch into, you know, one of the apps. Uh, actually, let me search for an app instead. So let's say I want to search for uh, the cricket app. You know, this is cricket season. So we'll go ahead and search for a cricket app. There is uh, Yahoo Cricket. Now, obviously, oh, there's a match happening and West Indies is 49 for three, uh, which is always good to know. The thing about this app is it's edge to edge, and you can see that, right? There is no maximize, minimize button. There is no resize button, anything. It's just edge to edge. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is this app has been written completely using HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS. It's a native app written in HTML5. So, so the bunch of programmers who wrote this, they haven't written Windows programs. All is our, our web apps. And they can take the exact same skills, HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS, and bring that over to Windows as a native app. So this is an app, along with many others, that you can find in the Windows Store, which is another new thing that we've introduced with Windows 8. So you build consumer applications, you can take those applications and put it into the store. Makes it easier for consumers to go discover your apps, find your apps, install your apps. But that's just one thing about Windows. Windows has also been you know, hugely popular in price. So in scenarios, you don't have to get apps from the store. You can also get it separately installed, like a typical enterprise app. And enterprise apps can be metro style apps, or they could be good old desktop apps. And I want to take a minute to show you the desktop here. So that's your desktop. So that's where PowerPoint is running. You know, that's where I have my wallpaper and so on and so forth. That's, that's one set of, you know, one, one genre of apps. Uh, let me show you another one, Kadarop. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you 
familiar with cut the rope, played with it. And let me, let me launch into cut the rope. So this is again a website, an HTML5 app has also been implemented and it's installed uh, as part of the Windows Store implementation. So we can go to cut the rope uh, and again, works well with keyboard and mouse. So I'm going to use the mouse at this level, cut it and Omnon gets the candy, wonderful and nice. Now for the next level, let's go ahead and play with, uh, with the touch experience. Oops, and Omnom is going to be very unhappy, oh, maybe not. So first grade experience of user interface across multiple input types. That's one thing. Uh, but if you head back into the store, you can see a lot of other apps. So, so yes, we've got Times of India there, you can see that. Uh, you could even do small things like, you know, search for an app, and this is interesting. So, we don't want apps to implement search inside that. So if you notice the store app, there is no search button anywhere. You just click an app and you install the app. But if you do want to search it, you can go into the search pane and you can use the touch keyboard here. And we have different types of keyboard. We have a thumb typing keyboard, uh, if, you can, if you can look at the bottom, uh, which is just a pure thumb typing. Of course, it could do quirt, you know, good old QWERTY. So let's say I want to search for uh, an app that does something with photos. And if you, if you look at it closely, the search is actually happening inside the, the store. So you can click on photos and you get all the apps in the store that have anything to do with photos. So search experience is available to all applications. You need to implement the search contract. And uh, from, from our work uh, with user interface, we know most applications need search functionality. They also need share functionality. So, so let me get into, let's say, uh, Photo Vault, which is a collection of really nice uh, photos. And I can pick any of those photos, and I can say search, share. In this case, the app doesn't implement sharing. But if you get to another app uh, which does implement sharing, let's say the NDTV app, you can pick a news article, and you can get into the uh, share implementation. And we can pick whichever apps implement share recipient contracts, such as mail or, or Facebook or any of those. You can go ahead and share to those. The other one that I want to show you, of course, is IE10. We briefly went into this. Uh, and in IE10, we've implemented the same fundamental uh, Chakra engine, which does JavaScript rendition and HTML5 rendition. Uh, and the same browser is available both in the desktop mode as well as uh, on, on, in the Metro style interface. So if I were to quickly go back into the desktop mode, I can launch IE, and here is, you know, uh, here are all the Twitter feeds going along, and I, I can get the same experience uh, from inside the Metro Style user interface as well. The, the advantage, of course, is in the Metro Style world, you have access to full blown touch, and in this particular browser, we implemented it in fourth. So, for touch hardware, this is how you would go forward, and this is how you would go back. Uh, on the classical desktop one, you obviously have your back and front keys. One other thing that I want to show you, and particularly because a lot of noise has been made about this, is those red squiggly lines that you see in your browser and how IE doesn't implement them. Uh, and this is, this is one of my favorite parts, right? So we, so we know who came up with the red, red squiggly lines uh, every time you do, a, you do a, a, a spelling mistake. Goes back to word 97. So we said, you know, we obviously want to implement spell check, but we want to do one better. So play, pay close attention to this demo. So this is such a crazy thing to happen. So not only do we do spell check, we also do autocorrect inside the browser. Uh, I, can, I can demonstrate some other stuff. So let's say, let's do, oops, that's a correct spelling. So you do wrong spellings, that inside the browser for you. So I can with spell check and autocorrect. And obviously it gets, gets better with time. So that's, that's about, you know, touch first UI, OS on the edges, fast and fluid uh, interface that works across keyboard and mouse, as well as touch, and some of the application experiences and how search and share experiences work inside, uh, work inside Windows 8. Now, as the next step, I want to talk to you a little bit about the developer experience. You know, how do you go build apps for some of these things? And for that, I want to introduce my colleague Raj uh, onto the stage. So Raj, come on over. <coughs> So, you know, the, you know, very briefly, uh, you know, just kind of wanted to cover uh, uh, some of the things that Harish had hinted upon, right? So, he mentioned that uh, the Yahoo app was written completely with HTML5 JavaScript, cut the rope, uh, you know, do you want to do this as to 
to what language, uh, what platform that has been built on, like what technology stack that has been built on. Uh, how many of you think it's a native C++ DirectX hardware accelerated, you know, like as fast as you can, nobody. Okay, the fact that I'm asking the question, I guess you guessed. Uh, <laughs> it is HTML5, JavaScript, CSS. Uh, so, uh, in fact, it's, it's a website, right? So you can go to cutthero.ie and you can play it on the browser and it's a metro style app as well. Um, and, and, and the interesting thing is this is a journey that we started with IE9. So in IE9, graphics are hardware accelerated and the same <clears throat> hardware acceleration is now available in IE10 as well. So, so if you do a graphically intensive site or a game such as Kadarop, basically, you know, runs really, really quick, really, really fast. Right. In fact, uh, you know, the, the funny thing about Kadarop is once they implemented Kadarop as a metro style app, it turned out that the app ran so fast mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it, it ran too fast, right? I mean, it, it ran so fast it became not usable. So they actually had to introduce some code to kind of slow the frame rate down so that it becomes a usable game that you know, people can play with. Yeah, so you cut the rope, you can see the candy falling, right? Otherwise the candy would fall too fast and the online would eat it really, really fast. So slow it down a little bit. Also they had to do that to match the experience on the other platforms. Right, right. So make sure it's consistently slow across all. Yes. Yeah. Um, so just kind of wanted to quickly give you a, a, a sense of, you know, what the, the, it's like a polyglot environment, right? What is, what is the language that you are familiar with, right? Are you a native guy? You know, Great. I mean, we've got an entire programming, you know, stack that's that's like built for you. Are you a web developer? And that's like, you know, we can build desktop apps with web technologies. Are you a managed developer? I mean, then that's like that's. I mean, that managed development is Microsoft Baby, right? So you are like completely at home here. So, so the first thing I just wanted to kind of show you here. Let me get these mics off. Uh, and again, this is beta, you know, software. Uh, feel free to download both Visual Studio 11 beta as well as uh, uh, Windows 8 consumer preview and you can, you know, you can install this, play with it. If you've got a Windows 7 machine, you know, same spec, no additional hardware required. So the exact same system requirements for Windows 7 as well as Windows 8. So I've just gone here and launched uh, Visual Studio 2011. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just quickly, you know, uh, build an app. Uh, so something that you probably can't do from a web, uh, web environment, right? So this is a, this is a laptop here which has a, which has a webcam. So what does it take to build an app that accesses the webcam, you know, takes a picture from the camera and then saves it to some location on the disk? So I just, I just hit file new project. Uh, so you can see that, uh, you know, there are a few templates here. I'll go ahead and select JavaScript, which is the new template now. Uh, I'll go ahead and select blank application. And then if you're a web developer, the solution structure that you see here should look really familiar. Yeah, if you could just zoom into the Solution Explorer and show them the structure. Right. That'd be nice, yeah. So, let me just zoom right in here. So you can see that, you know, this structure is pretty much uh, what you are used to if you're a web designer, right? So you have your HTML, you have your script files all inside a JS folder, you have your CSS, and then, you know, as you build your app, that's essentially what you're doing. You're creating more HTML pages, you're, you know, writing your logic and your JavaScript, you're styling it with your CSS and so on. Uh, so it's, it's the exact same experience. The, so, so what does the platform provide? So, for web developers, you have the entire Windows uh, API, the Windows system, which is called as the Windows Runtime or WinRT. You know, that's a, probably a term that you will probably hear throughout this conference as well. So, WinRT, the entire Windows system uh, interface, is accessible to you as a web developer. So, for instance, you know, what does it take to build, a, you know, maybe uh, capture an image? So, what I'll do is I'll go here and uh, open my HTML. Uh, so, you can see that this is fully... Uh, this is just HTML5 here, right? So folks who can recognize this doc type, you know that this is uh, the new HTML5 way of doing things, right? So I'll go ahead and uh, maybe, you know, add a button here. Uh, I'll call it as button capture. Uh, I'll probably put not very, you know, probably not the best user interface, but the point is to kind of show you, you know, how you can interface with, with WinRT in a fairly straightforward manner. So I'll put a placeholder IMG tag here. I'll probably call this IMG cell or something. And that's my markup. So it's co completely standards compliant uh, JavaScript, right? So I'll go here and uh, define a function, probably called init. And what I'll do is I'll hook up a, a click handler for my button here called button capture. So I go and say document dot query selector. So query selector is a new, uh, you know, a new CSS3 selector syntax that you can use to select uh, HTML elements. So I'll go here and use uh, I think button capture was the ID. Uh, I'll add an event handler for that. So I'm interested in the click event. So I'll probably call a function called onClick. Uh, 
So go ahead and define on click here. So the you know how do you access the WinRT? So the the types that allow you to access the webcam, for instance, are inside a namespace called as Windows.media.capture.cameraCaptureUI. Now you might be thinking, you know, what's exactly going on here? So this is this looks like standard JavaScript code, right? I'm creating an instance of a you know uh, if you know your JavaScript, then this is basically a constructor function. Now it turns out that's not the case here. So even though this looks like regular JavaScript. What we're actually creating here is a native object. So camera capture UI is a COM-based native component that the Windows operating system provides. And I'm able to instantiate it, you know, call methods on it, access properties, handle events, and so on and so forth, completely, you know, uh, without having to deal with the fact that I'm actually dealing with a native component here. You know, folks who have done interop before, you know, know the pain of, you know, uh, doing that in, in, in earlier versions, right? Yeah, uh, you would typically do a new ActiveX object and call into a COM component I mean, if, you, if you use that. Uh, but in this case, it's, it is a COM component, but we've done all the hard work that you can call into any native object from C++, C Sharp, JavaScript in the same way. So in fact, there's a session on the platform, uh, the Metro style platform by Rama. You should probably you know, uh, take a look at that session where we'll go into further detail about language projection, how this thing looks in C++, C Sharp. So what I'll do here is go ahead and call a method called capture file async. So this is basically is the method that captures the image from the camera. Uh, in an asynchronous manner, obviously, like the method says. Yes. Uh, so since this is, a, this is an I.O. operation, right? So, any, so one of the things that you will probably find, uh, uh, you know, repeated to death is fast and fluid. Now, the, the reason is it's a user experience uh, thing, right? So we don't, any time an application does not respond when I go touch it, it's broken, right? The user feels like, wait, you know, app is hung. Right? So that's something that we absolutely do not want the users to see. So any API, any function call that does an I/O uh, operation or anything that can block would become an asynchronous call. And you know, handling async in JavaScript, C# -sharp and C++ has been uh, you know made really, really straightforward, elegant. The pain of doing you know asynchronous uh, development is pretty yeah. much taken care. A anybody who's written async code knows writing async is really, really hard, especially the portion you call back. Right, uh, and when you when you look into each of these three languages, C++, managed as well as JavaScript, you realize you can write async code that looks synchronous, and that's what you're going to look, take a look at. Exactly. So here, all I'm doing is I'm saying calling the capture file async API, and then you know, I, in fact, it, this sounds like English, right? And say and then call this function, and that function essentially is the callback is going to get invoked when the async call completes. So here, you know, basically, I get the file that was captured as a as a parameter here to the callback. So all I need to do is take this and assign it to my image tag, right? So I'll go ahead and acquire a reference to my image. Uh, I call that img cell. So what do we need here? I need to set the src property for that to this particular file. So one thing that I'll do here is I'll use a HTML5 feature called as url.createObjectURL, which allows me to, uh, you know, acquire a URL which I can as assign to uh, an image src property. Uh, for things like, you know, for example, if you have a blob, right, and that blob represents an image, how do you show it on, on your markup? You say url.createObjectURL. So in this case, this is a storage file object. This is a WinRT object. And I, I want to assign that image as the reference to my, uh, to my HTML image element. Then that's how you do it. Uh, so that's pretty much it. One additional thing that we'll have to do is, uh, so there's something called as a package manifest where we have to declare that this particular application intends to use the webcam. Which is basically a security, uh, you know. Basically, that's the thing that when you go to the store, you might have seen what all capabilities this app requires. It will say that this app requires access to your webcam, and the user gets to choose whether they want to install that app or not. So that's where you declare that you know this app needs access to the webcam. So simple capabilities. So is your application going to access camera? Or is it going to access your location? Is it going to access your sensor? All of that are capabilities that you describe in the package manifest. Again, so, a simple checkbox in Visual Studio. Right. So I just went and hit F5. Uh, obviously, not the best looking UI you're going to see. So I'll go ahead and click uh, click here. Okay. Uh, I wrote a nice function and everything. I forgot to call the function. forgot to call the init function. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and call it. So that's hook, that hooks up my event handler and everything else. So I go ahead and hit. Uh, so even if you declare that your app accesses the webcam, the system will still you know this is a problem that I have no access control over. This is something that the Windows operating system is uh, you know putting up to the user. You obviously, you know, this is a good thing because you don't want applications spying on your camera without spying on you without you knowing about it. So I still get to choose whether I want to provide access to the camera or not. So you know, that's pretty large. That's yeah. 
and uh, I'll go ahead and click a picture and I'll hit OK and then you know that whole picture got rendered on the on the IMG tag you know so the end result kind of seems anticlimactic but <laughs> <laughs> not pretty not pretty not as pretty <laughs> exactly. as I wanted to be uh, but what's really happened here is you know we have used JavaScript web technologies and we've actually used uh, you know the Windows operating system APIs in a completely seamless fashion right anybody who looks at this code you know as a web developer you probably feel completely comfortable with it um, the one last thing that I would probably wanted to show you is how does this code look like uh, from C sharp and, and C++ so I'm not going to sit and type that whole thing here again uh, so in fact I did this yesterday evening to you know uh, to see how this would this would work so here is a C++ example I know this looks like a lot more code that's uh, Mostly because I didn't. Uh, but trust us, this feels natural for a C++ developer. <laughs> Absolutely. So here, basically, we've used the task parallel library, the TPL, to do essentially the same thing. So you can see that I've done a ref new of the camera capture UI object. I call capture file async. In fact, this looks a lot like JavaScript, if you notice. So I'm creating a task object here, and I say task object dot then, and I provide a lambda method. So this is C++ 11, right? The latest spec uh, of the C++ standard, the latest version of C++ standard. So I provided a lambda method here. And I access the storage file. Uh, here I'm doing one more step. I take that file and put it in the in the pictures folder, and finally assign it to my to my image here. So I load it into a bitmap image, and this is C++. So here it's not HTML, obviously. You're, you're you get design. XAML instead, which is beautiful. You get XAML instead, right? So if you are familiar with WPF and Silverlight, then you are completely comfortable doing UI both in C# -sharp and C++ because it's the XAML that you know and love. So here I've created a button and a image in my XAML, and then I just assign that here. What does this look like in in C sharp? This is probably best of the best yeah. of a lot, at least from a, and and that makes sense because C sharp is a is a is a language that has been optimized for developer productivity, and it's it's the newest of the languages really. Right. So here you can see that there is essentially the same code looks like that. So here I create a you know a camera capture UI object. I call capture file async, and all that asynchrony is you know hidden behind this magic keyword called await. Uh, so as soon as I call this. You know the rest of this is going to get uh, automatically taken and you know created as a callback, and you know that's going to get invoked. So, so the code is entirely written synchronously. You would imagine that the lines of code execute serially, but the moment you put in the await keyword, everything after that goes into a callback. So, it, it's asynchronous code written synchronously. Think of that. So, you know, so that was essentially the the same scenario that we've implemented in three different uh, three different languages. Pick the language that you you are most comfortable with. Cool. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you. It said about hey, you know. Touch hardware is here. Where is where is Windows and so on? Uh, and I also wanted to just take a minute and share with you what's the size of the opportunity when we talk about Windows. Uh, till date, there are about you know 525 million PCs uh, that are running Windows 7. All these 525 million machines out there are all going to be able to run Windows 8 because we've kept the hardware spec exactly the same. Even if we don't sell you know new machines, which obviously we will. And at this point, I want you to sit back and think about the scale of the opportunity, right? A lot has been said about, said about, hey, you know, you've got these tablet devices from that food company, you've got these other uh, phones that are coming up and so on. These are real numbers, right? So till date, 234 million Android phones out there. Add Android tablets, another 13 million. iPhone devices, you know, another 112 million. Add iPad, another 40 million. Add Mac machines, that's 30 million. Real numbers. You add all of them together, you know, 247 million uh, Android devices, 152 million iOS devices, you add both of them together, it's still smaller than the number of Windows 7 PCs that are there today. That's the size of the opportunity. So you could add all of these together and you're still smaller than the install base of the last operating system. This does not include stuff that we've sold before Windows 7, so Windows Vista, Windows XP, Windows 3.1, Windows 95, Windows 98, not included. This is just the last version. So the call to action. The call to action, quite simply, is you know, target Windows because this is the biggest developer opportunity ever that's come for any developer in the industry. This is the biggest. Uh, in terms of download, you can go to preview.windows.com and you can download Windows 8 uh, Consumer Preview. You can also get Visual Studio 11 Beta. All of that is free. It is also unsupported because of, of the same reason. Uh, but I encourage you to go build your apps and bring them to the Windows 8 store. Soon, our uh, stall, take a look at the hardware that we have there and feel free to ask questions. Thank you.